Good morning, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Welcome to the visitors. May God's blessing come upon you. Hallelujah. It has uh, fallen upon me to preach today. Amen. And I thought, as I said, her, how many preachers we have around, and I, I never thought of asking someone else. Sometimes we are in the ministry a while, we get in the habit of wanting to get out of preaching. After you preach a long time, young men, you lose the preacher's itch. <laughs> and then you develop the preacher's evasion. <laughs> There's always a problem to contend with in the human context. Did you know that? You know, Israel had idolatry for a long, long time. Hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years, idolatry. Prophets could always stand up and cry out against idols. Then Israel went to uh, Babylon captive. They came back, never had idols anymore had hypocrisy after that. <laughs> Jesus came and cried out against hypocrisy. Praise God. And uh, let us pray just a moment together now as we approach the Word of God. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The Bible says, He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. That must mean letting the Word of God become part of us. Holy Father, we have come to this place this time. We're opening up your book, your word. Give us the grace to let your word speak for itself without twisting it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, Father, who came and delivered a clear message. May there arise a body in the earth today who will give a clear message and disentangle themselves from the snares of this age and the deceptions. May thy word sound again a clear note, a trumpet of warning, that your people may prepare themselves for war. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to Judges chapter 13. <clears throat> This man Samson on my mind, I've been reading the scriptures concerning him and what some of the others had to say about him. The Bible story of Samson opens with these words, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So we find this chapter, chapter 13, a, con a study in contrasts. It reveals human guilt and divine grace. It is my opinion that when man is guilty, when God's people are guilty, you cannot sing away the guilt. You cannot praise away the guilt. We cannot use latter rain or charismatic techniques to twist the hand of God to bless us when we are guilty. I am convinced of this. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. They had not just done it this time for the first time, but there is a, a repetitious light motif in this book where God's children are repeatedly doing evil in the sight of the Lord. We can find that in uh, five other places that I have marked in this book. Let us look back into the second chapter. Verse 1, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt. When God speaks to us, he reminds us of what he has done for us in the past. It's not a 
God out of machines springing upon us like a jack-in-the-box and say, I'm the Almighty God, uh, why aren't you doing better? But he reminds us of a continuity of a redemptive past. We are serving the God this morning who brought Israel up out of Egypt a long, long time ago with a stretched out arm with mighty signs and wonders. Hallelujah. And he revealed himself by the name Jehovah at the burning bush, which means I am the living one. In other words, I worked back then, I am alive today, I am the same and I never change. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And uh, it's no secret that the atmosphere here down is a little, uh, today is a little bit down, is a bit of a psychological downer. But that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I find that in the Bible. And I find that in the context of defeat and gloom and confusion, that if you can break through and see the throne, it is valid to shout and rejoice right then. Amen. Hallelujah. I am not deferring my shouting and my glorification to a future age when everything has been rectified, but even today I see him who shall rectify and the consummation that is coming. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise is always in order, even at funerals. Blessed be God. I was preaching over in Rochester with the Garlington brothers and learned while I was there that one of the great black leaders of America just died, Bishop Winley. And Bill Wilson, the pastor of Faith Temple, and John Jimenez and others were at his funeral, and they had a time of glory as a saint had the red carpet rolled out and went to meet his maker and his father. They shouted at that funeral. They rejoiced. There was victory. Praise God. Because there was a people who had transcended temporary circumstances and feelings. Blessed be God. Yes, God said, I made you go up out of Egypt. God brought me out of Egypt over 26 years ago. Hallelujah. I walked through the split walls of the Red Sea. <laughs> with a cloud of witnesses about me, <laughs> those fishy ones who knew nothing of God's redemptive power. You know, the Philistines' God was Dagon. And they had Samson in the temple at one day, and they were rejoicing over Samson. But you know what God revealed to me? Uh, fishy gods know nothing about what is going on in heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> the fish god knows nothing. The gods of this world know nothing about the power of God to reach in and invade their territory and pull us out. Hallelujah. I was pulled out of this world order in spite of the God of this age, in spite of the darkness, in spite of the prevailing dis uh, uh, disobedience in the church. God pulled me out. God not only saves men in days of fire and glory and power, he also saves men in the midnight hour of darkness. Hallelujah. And as Dr. Hero said, if you won't shout with me, I'll shout all by myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. I was pulled out as one solitary individual in view of the eternal hallelujah, and I can walk in light in the midst of darkness. So says the word of God. Amen. Amen. Blessed be God. Praise hallelujah. Praise By his grace, I know something. I know that he brought me up out of Egypt. And God said, I brought you unto the land which I swore this God of ours who swears by himself, swears by himself because there is no greater. And he who vows and swears and declares and promises is well able to do it. Hallelujah. I swore it unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. That's why we can return to him at any time. The Spirit of God moves us and draws us. You know, I remember when Brother Kelly Varner was here, he said a word that probably escaped most people. He said, some of you are fighting things that aren't even there. And we as human beings tend to, to settle down into a context of a human mentality of defeat. And we feel that the same negative feelings that are ruling us are also ruling God. But I have news for you. Your feelings are not ruling God. Hallelujah. 
And God sort of sums this all up in the word of a messenger or an angel by saying in verse 2, Ye have not obeyed my voice. Let me turn to the other references I have marked out in this book, progressive, as they move through the chapters, almost chapter by chapter, Judges 3 and 12. Children of Israel did evil again. Here's another reference to alternate apostasies and reconcilements. The fluctuation of God's people, ups and downs. The typical spiritual life, a land of hills and valleys. But someone said it. Brother Tim may have mentioned it to me. Charles Hahn, I guess. In the great kingdom prophecy in Isaiah chapter 40, where the prophet says these words, words of promise, words of challenge, every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked, the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. The glory of the Lord is revealed in steadfastness. Praise God. When Jesus Christ appeared to Saul and sent him into Damascus, he was living on a street that is called Straight. God wants to straighten out our lives, not just to get the sin out, but to get the fluctuation out, to get the psychological downers which have no foundation in the word of God. They have their foundation in old fallen Adam. Amen. But their foundation is not in the word of God. God wants to even us out that the glory may be revealed. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Judges 3 and 12, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Judges 4 and 1. Children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them. <laughs> I almost see a throne room scene akin to the book of Job. And there's an auction going on. And God and Satan are bidding for the people. <laughs> the Bible says the Lord sold them into the hand of these Gentile leaders. Judges 6 and 1. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And you must remember when we read this book, this particular book out of the Bible, Judges, this is one of the books penned by prophetic writers. And these men write with discernment. And the greatest thing that you can discern in your generation is the hand of the Lord. Amen. Where is the hand of the Lord and what is it doing? Is the interpretation correct today of charismatic jubilation that the hand of the Lord has come forth solely to bless? And that the blessed may come would be the appropriate way of approaching God? I have not bought that. I'd like that. My flesh cries out for that. Oh, bless me. And all carnal ones, oh, that Ishmael might live in thy sight, said Abraham. We want the carnal production of Christians to be blessed by God. We want to make a thing and then, God, then call God later as an auxiliary to add his power to it. It was right in this very room, perhaps, behind, uh, on this very spot that a, a world-known man of God stood and made a proposition at Pinecrest years ago. He said, brethren, I have a plan to evangelize Europe. And he said, it'll work. He said, all, all we have to do is get God interested in it. <laughs> I believe when God sent his son as a sacrifice to, for sin to die for the whole world, God revealed his interest in saving Europe. That's the, those are the very terms the preacher used. He's still traveling around the world. He may be spinning his wheels. I don't want to be spinning my wheels. I want to get hold of something. Amen. I want to be taken over by the group of faith and lay hold of the ancient promises that motivated my father Abraham and took him out of an idolatrous society and made him a father of this great family of which we're a part today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want my eyes to be open to eternal realities. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Thank you, Lord. Judges 10 and 1. 
One way to learn is by repetition. That's how all worldly virtuosos learn. Repetition, repetition. That's the Hebrew method of education, repeating the Word of God. Did you know that? That's why we have so little mastery in America. We don't like repetition. We have avoided, we have condemned it, we have cast it out. And here we are, a land of know-nothings, a land of jellyfish, a land of Christians whose main enterprise is to grow a wishbone where a backbone ought to be. The theology of wishful thinking and futurism is dominating the day. There's got to be somebody make a breakthrough into God's eternal now and hear what thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Judges 10 and 6. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Sir Balaam and Ashtaroth. What's Balaam? It means the demon gods. It means the demonic powers that dominated in their generation. It means the diverse elements of the spirit of their age, which has been mediated to us by television, newspapers, magazines, and our universal educational system today. It has mediated to us the demonic powers of our time. God wants to set us free. He said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Well, let's go back. I like to paint a very, very dim picture. Because God teaches us by contrasts. One of the sermons I heard in my life is unforgettable. was preached by a great Methodist pulpit artist. His name was Robert Hover Bodine. And I'll never forget the, the uh, art of his preaching and the power of his preaching. He was a romantic pulpit artist, masterful. And one time he preached a sermon by painting a series of dim and dismal and defeated pictures, a series of vignettes. And then at the end of each one of his dim pictures, he would ask this question. But have you ever heard his trumpets blowing? And have you ever seen his banners flying? For lurking in the shadows in every dim and defeated age of history, there lurks the reality of the militant, triumphant church. Hallelujah. Praise God. Inside of you, defeated Christian, if so you be, there is a victorious man screaming to get out and manifest himself in this present age. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. You are not here this morning by accident, but you are meant to be here. You are called to be a warrior. Hallelujah. You were born to be armed with sword and shield and spear and panoplied in the very panoply of God's own grace. Hallelujah. And we are here on this ground at this crossroads of time and space keeping an appointment with a divine destiny. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, the mighty man is in you, struggling to get out into manifestation that you may truly glorify your God in a satisfying measure both to him and to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like going through, don't you? How, how many are going through by the grace of God and by the name of our God? Hallelujah. Praise his name. I learned a victorious chorus, a chorus of victory just recently. It says, I will arise and go forth in the name of the Lord of hosts, for he has conquered every foe by his name, by his name. I will declare he is the Lord, and in him I am not afraid. I will arise and go forth. Would you like to sing it right now? Would you like a change? Why should we here until we die? Let's get up to our feet. Hallelujah. Let's cease to be uh, typical ecclesiastics. Would you sit, sister? Give me some kind of a standard key. One that would be a fitting receptacle of victory. We haven't been melted together. We have been formed into an army. We can experience victory. Praise God. Yes, the Bible says the children of Israel did evil, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years.
chapter 13 and verse 1 of Judges. <clears throat> and the name Philistines means in Hebrew, the wallowers. The people who wallow in carnality, who wallow in defeat, who wallow in self, who wallow in the mud hole that belongs to the lower order of things, who remain in the thraldom of the elemental spirits of our time. God sold his people or delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Verse 2. Praise God for the grace of God. It says there was a certain man. That's one of the most interesting phrases in the Bible. One of the most interesting statements. It's a statement is full of meaning for me. For that statement more than hints that God deals with every one of us as a highly defined individual. It tells you that God has you under the great microscope of his watchful providential care and he has focused precisely on you. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel there was a certain man whose name was Elkanah. The Bible tells us in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, God is aiming his advances his overtures is knocking at a certain man he says if any man hear my voice and open the door i will come into him and will sup with him and he with me i think one of the great tragedies and one of the ecclesiastical crimes that are being perpetrated in our time is that the as that the, the the collective means everything the individual means nothing if there is any truth that I stand for, any truth that Brother Taylor stands for, that Pinecrest is here for, it, it is that you, the individual, have infinite value in the sight of God, and that you, as one man, can stand up and defeat the enemy. Hallelujah. God said to Gideon, he says, thou shalt defeat them as one man. Amen. The message of communism is a message that the collective is all. That we're all the victims of impersonal historical forces. That we're all subjected to necessity. That we are bound. That, we, uh, that this thing called individual faith is only a myth or a fairy tale. But I refuse to relinquish the knowledge that the faith in, of God in an individual yet has its old power and dynamic to move people and change things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. There was a certain man. You are a certain man, are a certain woman. And God himself wants to deal with you. Will you let him? Hallelujah. Something else that I find to be a delightful truth is the fact that in any given situation, I believe there is a prophetic element present for the man whose vision penetrates and breaks through the surfaces of things. No truer thing could be said of scientific knowledge, of a scientific age. No truer thing could be said of the philosophy of science than that it is a, it is a, a vision <clears throat> that looks at and is reflected from the surfaces of things. Science is incurably superficial. Science looks at surfaces. That's true of every science. But by the Holy Ghost, by the bestowment or the endowment of divine vision, you will be the recipient as a child of God and, and this thing when the Lord visited a friend of mine in the middle of the night about 15 or 20 years ago, this man has revelation. He's been taken in the spirit. He's seen the departed dead, seen heaven, he's seen hell. Christ has come to him many times, spoken to him. He has seen miracles done, 
He's a miracle worker. He's an unknown. You'll never read about him in the papers. You'll never see him in a magazine. You'll never see him on TV. He can't speak English. He's one of those choice vessels that's, uh, that whom God has hidden. And one night the Lord Jesus came in the middle of the night and said, This that you have is the Orim and the Thummim that belong to every child of God. Your gift of God is divine intuition. The vision that not only looks upon, but penetrates through surfaces into the ground of meaning of things. And in this situation, there's a prophetic element in a name, Manoah. For in a time of unrest, Manoah's name means rest or comfort. Hallelujah. If we had the ear to hear or the eye to see today, we would discern prophetic elements in our present generation, in our present debacle, in our present stalemate that speak to us of God's victorious arm working in the unseen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I believe that just as Samson was prepared in an out-of-the-way place, an obscure part of Israel, not among the official Levitical men, not among the divinely constituted governments of men or the government of Israel, not a government of man, but a government of God, not out from the ranks of the governmental ones, but out from a barren woman comes him who is to judge God's people. Hallelujah. There is a prophetic element in our day. God has been witnessing by his spirit that he's going to move again. I was just up to visit Bill Hickson on my way to Michigan a few weeks ago. And Bill is a prophetic man. He's a man who has vision, who has penetrated. That's the reason for the charismatic unrest. They are looking not at eternal things, but temporal blessings. Your eyes must penetrate beyond surfaces if you are to be led by God and come to your fulfillment in Christ. And I sat down in his living room for a while. We only were to have about six or eight hours together. He had to go away, and God had detained him at Faith Haven. And when I pulled in, he said, now I know the reason why I was detained. We had to say something in the spirit. We had to, we two spirits had to communicate something. And we find a deep sympathetic resonance when we are together. As I sat in his living room, he said to me, Brother Healy was here just recently, old Esmond Healy. He's around 85 years old now. He's the man who gave me that one coat that I wear at times. And Bill and Brother Healy and Sister Healy sat down in that room. Sister Healy is about 82 now. English woman, he's an Englishman. They've known the Lord since Pentecostal days. They have been full of the operation of the Holy Ghost. Oh, that God would bestow upon us the feelings that are beyond feelings. Hallelujah. Not the feelings that are inspired by the sight of the carnal eye, but the feelings that fall from the throne and come down and begin to invade us. We need an invasion from the throne, brother and sister. In the first reference I read to the disobedience, an angel comes, speaks a message, and they weep. Brother Parkins asked a question concerning us at Pine Cross. Where is the weeping? Where is the old concept of a declared message? and a repentance with the weeping. And Bill said to old Brother Healy, are you looking for visitation? He's already been in the Pentecostal visitation with an anointing that the people of today know nothing about. He was already in the latter rain visitation. He was in the sonship meetings when they were going all right. And he outlived all that. And Bill said to him, looking him in the eye, he said, are you looking for visitation? And immediately Brother Healy burst into tears and wept. But he wasn't weeping as a man. He was experiencing a Holy Ghost operation. He was also in the forward move at Elam in 33 and 34 at Hornell. He was part of that. He was through many things, and he immediately began to weep, but not weeping because the old days were past, because he was sad. That wasn't it. It was an instantaneous thing, which was an operation of the Holy Spirit. And then Sister Healy began to speak in other tongues and had a vision. 
And Bill told me this. And she said, I see a broad green place. And I see multitudes of all kinds of people running into that place. And she said, I see you there ministering to them. And as Bill told me that story, it witnessed in the spiritual dimension of my being and burnt like fire. And Sister Healy said to Bill several times, she said, it's hard to wait, isn't it? It's hard to wait, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to wait, isn't it? Hallelujah. But you know, it's worth waiting. For they that wait upon the Lord shall, shall renew their strength. Not that they will be given more of this creature's strength, that I will look a little more like a Mr. Universe, that every muscle would grow a little bit and my physical stature would rise and I'd become a dominant man of the flesh. That's not what the Bible means. It means that they that wait upon the Lord will become recipients of the invading grace from another world. Hallelujah. Alien thoughts, alien feelings will begin to take possession of us and we will begin to act in a superhuman manner. Hallelujah. Praise God. Is it only if I preach victory, Brother Snowman? Not victory down the road, but victory now. Hallelujah. Jesus uh, cried out from the cross, it is perfect. Hallelujah. I declare a perfect victory today. And the manifestation is worth waiting for, for God himself will burst forth in all of his power and splendor for those who wait. Hallelujah. Praise God. They that wait upon the Lord shall exchange their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will be endowed with an equipment that enables them to navigate the God realm, the God dimension. Not the dimension of church building programs and ecclesiastical changes and laws uh, uh, for and laws against. Not that realm, but the realm of the true, pure, supernatural, which alone satisfies man's hungering heart. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Bible says there was a certain man of Zorah, or Zoraea of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. You know, you never know who's walking around in our midst with a revelation. See, Manoah's name has prophetic significance. It was not given by accident or in vain. And I'm reminded of someone in the pages of the New Testament who was walking in the midst for years and years and years, and no one was aware of what that man was bearing. Look at Luke chapter 2. And verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that I'm not preaching in vain today because I know by discernment that there are ones in this room of whom it could be said in all truthfulness, the Holy Ghost is upon him or the Holy Ghost is upon her. And we know from the text here that the Holy Ghost upon Simeon was not in a visibly radiant form so everybody in Jerusalem would know and follow his lead. But the Holy Ghost was upon him in an unmanifest form to everybody else. Only he knew it. And the Lord God himself who put the Holy Ghost upon him. Nobody needs to know but you and God. If you walk with God. Hallelujah. Jesus said, they shall walk with me in white. He said, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness of people. But the glory of the Lord shall be, arise upon thee. God is quite capable of visiting the solitary individual. In fact, that's the way he does it. With God, it is always that solitary individual alone before the eternal. The evil of the mass, mass man, collective man, is that the individual can hide from his responsibility in the herd. God will, like a good sheepdog, he'll cut you out. He'll get you over on the other side of the hill by a bush and he'll talk with you and the bush will burn with fire. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. Oh, how many God bearers are there in the world today and nobody else knows. 
Yes, the Bible says the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. There's the way to meet death. See Christ and then see death afterwards. For the terror of the Christ is so great that it will extract from death its power. And here is this man caring about a secret prophetic word in Jerusalem in a time of apostasy and decline. Hallelujah. I magnify such a reality as that. Older saints in this room, younger Christians, if you have the babe of revelation within you, cherish that reality above all things. Cater to it. Feed it. Fan it. Cultivate it. Give your all to it. For it will at length issue in that which will glorify God in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. <clears throat> the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. This is divine grace and mercy. Before ever anything stirs in the earth, something transpires in a throne in heaven. I was impressed with Tommy Hicks' vision of the end time ministry of the body of Christ, where he saw the body of Christ as a giant stretched out on the earth. The head and the feet reached from pole to pole, the arms spanned the equator. But the giant, representing the slumbering church, lay motionless, paralyzed, and covered with the debris of ages. And then as Tommy Hicks saw the vision, he saw the same vision three times. He saw rumblings, he heard rumblings, and saw a movement in heaven. And when there were rumblings in heaven, the giant responded in the earth. And the giant began to twitch and show movements of life. Hallelujah. And when heaven became quiescent, the, gi the giant sank back down again into paralysis. And then as heaven stepped up its operations, the giant had a, uh, an equivalently greater manifestation in the earth. Hallelujah. I believe those rumblings in heaven represent these modern revivals, that as heaven has stirred itself and heaven has spoken and heaven has rumbled, so the church in the earth responds with equivalent manifestations. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so here we see how God begins to move an age. He begins to move an age by sending something from the throne. Just one angel from the throne is enough to begin to put into motion a new age. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. And the angel doesn't come to a learned theologian, but to a woman. What does a woman know? God doesn't know what man knows. The Bible says when they came to the tomb that they were bringing spices, but they didn't need them. The Bible says when Samson attacked the lion, there was nothing in his hand. Hallelujah! Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Hallelujah! When will we discover that the entirety of what is needed is in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, that men, God wants not full men, but he wants empty men. Hallelujah! That he may pour into that receptacle himself. Hallelujah! 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 I feel the hearts of the potential ones among us today. The Bible says as many as received him, to them gave he power. To them he, he endowed that class with a potential that is divine. Gave them the potential to become the sons of God. Hallelujah. I sense crying potentials. I sense the cry of the vacuum to the appropriate inhabitant. And it is the God-shaped vacuum in every one of us this morning that is crying in the direction of the throne. Augustine had the insight. He said, God, our hearts were made for you, and never shall they rest until they rest in you. Hallelujah. You know, Samson's life story shows us something. It's all right to have a consecration and to have a word spoken over you, but you'll find that you've got to struggle for it every moment of your life, for there are invisible forces trying to tear from our grasp our true identity and make us forget who we really are. A consecration has to be renewed over and over 
and over and over and over and over. I am being challenged at this period of my life as I was never challenged before to lay it all down, to forget it. It's only something in the beyond. It's too difficult for mortal man of this generation of puny spiritual pygmies to aspire to. Lay it down or wrap it up and preserve it and pass it on to your posterity. But no, God is a now God, hallelujah. He's calling for a response now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think I'll just deal with about three main points out of this story today. The failure of man, human guilt. And then we see the paramount need for divine intervention. We need an invasion of grace and of revelation and of power today, don't we? That's revealed in verse, verses 2 and verse 3. <clears throat> I don't want to deal with the vow, the Nazarite vow. It wasn't, uh, it's not so germane to our purpose today. But there's another point that I want to deal with here. The angel of the Lord comes to the woman Tells her she's not going to be barren anymore. The curse is going to be lifted. Brother and sister, when God visits you, the curse is lifted. One word I heard in my life that thrilled my soul was a testimony that came out through an encounter with some demonic powers. Richard Vineyard was in Switzerland preaching. And some wizards or sorcerers heard his preaching, some people in witchcraft. This was around 25 years ago preached the gospel, and they came up to him after and said, Brother Vineyard, we would like to, or Reverend Vineyard, we would like to be saved. We'd like to become Christians and serve the Lord, but we have made a contract with hell. We have made a covenant with the devil. And because we made that, obviously we can't serve the Lord. We have bound ourselves. Richard Vineyard looked them in the eye and he said these words, Calvary cancels every contract. Hallelujah. <laughs> Adam made a contract in the garden that included me. I was included under the terms of the contract. Even as before Samson was born, he was included in the contract. Which was a good one by God. But when Jesus came into my life, he canceled my contract with hell. I no longer have to dance to the devil's tune. I don't have to uh, measure my life by the cadence of hell's destructive rhythms. But I can hear the very heartbeat of my father, which says, Salvation, 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 salvation. Hallelujah! The heartbeat of God is becoming the encompassing of my life today. And I hear it and I feel it and it interpenetrates my being. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. But after the angel came and went, the husband received the testimony of it and he wanted also to hear for himself. He wanted to see the angel. He wanted to understand with an immediate experience. I said immediate. That means non-mediated. You know, Job said one time, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. You know, I believe we ought to be thankful for secondhand things. I have a secondhand coat on today. I was given this coat. It's secondhand. And because it's just a practical thing of life, it's as good as a new one. I don't have anything else on second hand, I guess. My wife bought this tie for me. She picked it. It makes it second hand a little bit. She said, I hate to buy anything, but you're so fussy, nothing pleases you. <laughs> That's true. That's what's wrong with the church world. I'm easily pleased with the very best. And they serve me up a mess of pottage. 10 cents worth of lentil soup? You want me to be satisfied with that? I want an eternal birthright in heaven. Hallelujah. 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 
But when it comes to the gospel, we can never be satisfied with a second-hand account. Hallelujah. All the preaching of Jehovah or Elohim or whatever names they call him never brought Job to repentance, never made him hate himself. But he said, now that I see you, he said, I'm smashed. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, I abhor myself. I hate this flesh. And I repent. I am, I'm experiencing a mental revolution. Among other things, it got Job's mind off himself. He prayed for his friends after that. Yes. Hallelujah. Neutralize your oppressors by praying for them. <laughs> Cast the soul of grace all over them. <laughs> until they get smart. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. And so Manoah, the Bible says in verse 8, Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. First of all, I want to deal with the phrase, the child that shall be born. I have become convinced that real revivals, real visitations, are more like a baby than they are a political party or a movement. For what we are wanting and what we have wanted and what the vision that throbs in Brother Taylor's heart and was in his spiritual fathers, like Ivan Spencer and John White Follett and others, we have always wanted that which is not made with hands, but that which is born of God. We want to see something that can only, be, only come by travail. Hallelujah. Do you follow me? There is a statement in Isaiah's prophecy, probably chapter 41, that I'll open up to just briefly. <clears throat> How many can say praise the Lord today? It's a good day he gave us today, isn't it? You say, yeah, but there's a bad devil in this day. I don't care. I'll shout until he gets uncomfortable and leaves. Praise God. Hallelujah. God can and does frustrate the devil through men. <clears throat> Isaiah 41 and 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. That to me is the writing of commentaries and learned treatises on the word of God. It is an endeavor to explain or to interpret the meaning of the things God does in history. And of course, God does, and it gets written down, it gets put into a book, about a million words in the Bible, and then men write billions of words of explanation about it. Before the Christians ever came on the scene, the Jews had written a, a, a Jerusalem and a Babylonian Talmud, which fill an entire shelf. In other words, they took the five books of Moses, which are about that thick, and they wrote books that would reach from here up to the lunchroom, trying to explain it, <laughs> trying to understand how to treat the child. There are religious psychology books. And the penetration of understanding that is declared here by Isaiah is the burden of is that we must have prophetic insight to understand the babe that shall be born. And when the latter rain revival came to Detroit, God had chosen and ordained Myrtle Beale, who had been a French Catholic girl, a Catholic woman until she was, I think, 32 or thereabouts. And God's Spirit came upon that woman. She was a recipient of a clarity of experience that has rarely been equaled until God's voice came to her much like thunder out of the sky. In fact, when she was just a novice yet, she walked into an evangelical church on the east side of Detroit one Sunday. She had her three little children with her, and she was looking for God. She was going from church to church trying to find satisfaction for her spiritual longing. She wanted to get fed as a lamb or as a sheep. And that church that morning had no pastor and hadn't had for a while. And they were having an intramural fight over getting a new pastor. Factions had developed. They were warring and arguing. And she sat there 
Never having seen a fight in a Catholic church, they don't do that in a Catholic church. Haven't done it for about 1,500 years probably. But in Protestant churches, they fight. Even have a fist fight Sunday mornings. I have personal friends who have been in fist fights in churches. I never was, thank God. I can't fight. <laughs> I have short arms and little fists. I can't fight. Besides, I don't believe it's right. <laughs> The Sister Bill sat there in that church fight, and while she sat there, the voice of God sounded up above it all. Brother and sister, let me tell you, up above all this strife, the Word of God is sounding today. Hallelujah. If you will dare to rise above the littleness, the pettiness, the competitiveness, the factionalizings, and personality versus personal, you will hear the Word of God echoing in the chambers of eternity. Hallelujah. And Mrs. Bill heard it that morning, and this is what she heard. God said, tell these people they need to seek me. And I marvel at this woman's simple childlike boldness. She stood right up in that strange church, never been there before. She was a rather heavy set woman and she had a kind of a, she was a little bit like this, you know. She had authority. She looked round about on that congregation, pointed her finger up toward heaven, and she said, he says, you need to seek me. The words I've used haven't, aren't precisely exact, but almost exactly that she said. She said, he says, tell those people they need to seek me. And that entire church sprang out of their pews and rushed to the altar and began to repent. She heard the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. I said, she heard the word of the Lord. Blessed be God. Hallelujah. But after the great latter rain revival came, which was the answer to the cry and longing of many Pentecostal people, Mrs. Beale went to Toronto to have a meeting one time. While she was there, she had a dream vision. And in it, she heard a baby cry. <clears throat> Again, my recital may not be exact as to, to the precise details, but I've heard her tell it herself and others have told it to me. And she heard a cry of a baby and her mother's heart was gripped. In my opinion, the heart of a professional preacher is worthless in the ministry. It's a snare and a delusion. In the ministry, you have to have the heart of a mother or the heart of a father. Paul says to the Corinthians, you have 10,000 teachers, but not many fathers. Where are the fathers? As someone cried out in this chapel one day, where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? This charismatic movement has spawned perhaps millions of little orphan waifs who are straying the byways and the highways and the hedges just looking for a father. They can find those who will dominate them. They'll, I'll take charge of your life, sure I will. I'll take your ties and I'll boss you around. I'll tell you what to do. But where is the heart of the father that penetrates into the ground of need of your life and tells you just what you need to hear? The man who takes your money may tell you what you want to hear. The man who loves you as a father, that woman who loves you as a mother, will tell you that which you are crying out to hear, which is usually a corrective word. Hallelujah. And her mother's heart was just seized, and she had to find that baby, and she found it. She found it filthy, unwashed, unchanged, and starving, and was beginning to devour its own flesh. And in that dramatic, penetrating vision imagery, God showed the character of the latter rain revival. And in, a, in some uh, degree of panic, Mrs. Beale called back to Detroit and talked to her son Jim and she said, how is everything? And he said, mother, we can maintain this thing, but we can't feed it. You'll have to come back. And right now, God has showed me his children are starving in America. They're in teaching up to here, but they're starving. For that word that is addressed to them has not hidden them in the heart region. Hallelujah. Praise be his holy name. What I say is either madness or the truth.
Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord to God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. I sense very clear. That's what I call classic Pentecostal prophetic unction. And I'm going to give forth what I believe the sense of the Spirit's utterance was, that God looks down and sees that there are many who will become purveyors of religious knowledge of one brand or another. But God is saying, where is that people who will tune their receiving sets to the cry of God's heart? Hallelujah. I sense also it is the cry of the Word of God to emerge in prophetic freedom in our time. The very thing that Ivan Spencer rose up like a torch of fire after his vision in 1911 or 1912. In other words, the voice of God wanders disembodied looking for a, a voice to embody it that there may go a cry out in the wilderness of our time. Hallelujah. 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 It is an underlying prophetic pressure that must we must give vent to it in our generation that we might hear that clear direction and go forth. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. How many can say thank you, Jesus? We are under the impact of something in these days. We are, we've come under the blanket of the anointing, but there's a lot of frustration. But I say unto you, in the name of Jesus, we're going to cut through the frustrations of our time by the sword of God. Hallelujah. The Christian is that being who has power to penetrate. Hallelujah. Blessed be God. You may easily generate the idea, after what I read out of many passages, they disobeyed. God is in a wrathful mood upon the throne, ready to smash everything. <clears throat> but the grace of God is manifested in verses 8 and 9. Manoah entreated the Lord. That means he prayed earnestly from his heart. I pity all those who imagine they can twist God's arm somehow. All we can ever do is pray. All I can do is pray. And I believe that we are at the threshold of the revelation of prayer power again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> you feel the witness of the Spirit? Amen. We are at the threshold of the revelation of prayer power. I was reading an interview by, uh, with Martin Lloyd-Jones who was a mastermind of the evangelical world, took 12 years expounding the book of Romans. And he was describing to the editor of Christianity Today what is wrong in the world. And he said, with Charles Finney's advent, a concept of evangelism via organized meetings displaced the concept of revival. And ever since that time, whenever we would have anything, we call in somebody famous. And we set up a meeting. 
Prior to that, the concept of revival dominated, that the minister and God's people went before the Lord on their knees and cried out to the throne of grace. Amen. And the thing that, that did not seem evil in the beginning has become exceeding evil because it has become a channel of gimmicks. I read this statement and Harold was coming, I guess for years, and they said the man that will bring revival will be the man that can get God's people to pray. We have got to rediscover the latent power of prayer. Here is a puny man, not a Levite, not a really informed Israelite, just in the general flow of tradition, and just on the receiving end of liturgical religion. He says, oh Lord, hear me, hear me, come back, send that angel again. And the Bible says in verse 9, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. Not one of the greats of the Bible, not a prophet, not a priest, not a king, just a man, a certain man, God hearkened. You know, the Bible says, the wisdom, James epistle, James chapter 2, chapter 3 rather, <clears throat> the wisdom of this world, which gives rise to envying and strife, self-glory, glory in the flesh, lying against the truth, this worldly wisdom we find both in the world and in the church. Chapter 3 and verse 15. James says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly. The word sensual is psychikos. It means psychic and devilish. It is earthly and psychic and devilish. And it generates confusion in every evil work. But he says, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. It is easy to approach our Father using the name of Jesus and having in mind always the shed blood of Calvary. Hallelujah. So easy is he to approach. James says, if anybody lacks wisdom, ask God, he'll give it to you. And he won't have a big confab, and he won't bring up things out of the past and blame you for it. He'll give it to you. Yes, not Manoah entreated the Lord, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. Hallelujah. I could not go through with any other kind of a God than this. A God of all grace. That when you're needy and when you seem to be a ruined Christian and the devil says you sinned for the last time and you're under the ban of the unpardonable sin, James says, but he giveth more grace. Amen. Hallelujah. He gives a race for grace. Hallelujah. There's something written on the pages of the past that condemns. Hallelujah. And God's grace comes. Praise his holy name. Hallelujah. Glory to his name, I preach the riches of Calvary unto you that were loosed by the shedding of the blood. There was like no other blood that was ever shed. Amen. On the ground of the blood that stained the old rugged cross, I declare unto you entrance into the throne room this day. Not by works which we have done, but no merits of our own. My ticket is the blood. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. God is going to raise up a powerful people. A people who know their sins are gone. Hallelujah. In the crimson flood. Blessed be his name. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Lived a perfect life, a sinless life was crucified on a cross on a hill called Calvary. He died and he was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. Ascended to the right hand of the Father and poured out this, which you now see and hear and feel. 
and is the begetter of a new race of men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing about Jesus as we stand to our feet.